Hello, statistics students. In our last video, we covered the chi-square test for independence. We're going to continue that today with some more detail. Let's get started. So I'll share my screen with you. <clears throat> and in our last video, we um, did a problem in which we wanted to see, is there a relationship between grades and time spent on extracurricular activities? We kind of sort of did that by hand. Today I'm going to show you what it would look like if um, some statistical analysis software did that problem for us. And it turns out that the software I'm going to use is called Minitab. It's been around since I was in college. Obviously, it's been updated um, since then. So let's uh, let me find my oh, where is it? Here we go. So this is what we had last time. We said that um, we look at our column variables was how much time we spent on extracurricular activities a week, less than two hours, two to 12 hours, or more than 12 hours a week. Our row variables were good grades and bad grades. And we wanted to know if there was a relationship between the amount of time spent on extracurriculars, which is our column variable, and grades, which is our row variable. So we gathered some data. And if this is hard to see, that's a number 68 right there. <coughs> anyway, we had 82 students with good grades, 37 students with passing grades for a total of 119 students. Then we broke them up by how many hours they spent on extracurricular activities. The top number here, the 11, the 68, the 3, the 5, the 23, the 9, those are our observed data. That's the data we actually got. Now we have to come up with an expected value, and that expected value is based on the assumption that there's no relationship. That would be our null hypothesis. <coughs> So we take for, for this 11, for um, good grades, less than two hours of extracurriculars a week. What if, um, if everything were even Steven, how many students would we expect to be in this category? And we talked in the last video about how we do um, for, this num for this cell here, row total times column total divided by total total. So 82 times 20 divided by 119 gives us this number here. We would expect 13.78. Now, of course, you can't have 13.78, but this is a mathematical analysis, so it is okay. I myself would have rounded that off to 13.8, but then again, I'm not Minitab. Um, Minitab gives us a warning down here. There's one cell with an expected count less than five, and that's right here. But remember our rule of thumb. As long as all of our expected counts are greater than one, and no more than one in five is less than five, then we can do the analysis. The analysis will still be okay. And one in five would be 20% of them. And this is one out of six cells, which is only a little under 17%. So we're still good. Many tabs warning us, but we're still good. And I mentioned before how when we do our chi-squared components, we want to put them in the same format that, um, that our data is in. So our data is in um, a two-row, three-column format. And you'll notice that our chi-squared components are also in a two-row, three-column format. So O minus E, square that. You get, what's that, negative 2.78. You square that and then divide it by 13.78. That gives you this number. 68 minus 62.71. Square that, divide it by 62.71. Gives you this number. So it's the O minus E quantity squared divided by E. So we let Minitab do all that for us, and we come up with a chi-square statistic of 
These are all the components. They add up to the statistic itself. There are two degrees of freedom because it's rows minus one. So two minus one is one times columns minus one. Three minus one is two. One times two is two. <clears throat> and there's no reason to look up a critical value because Minitab is telling us the p-value is 3.1%. So if alpha was 5%, we would reject the null and we would say that there is a relationship between um, grades and extracurriculars. Now we would do a follow-on analysis and try to figure out where is that relationship. And so what we do is we go down here, where are the biggest components of chi-squared? Well, here we have 2.5, 1.2, and 1.1. So if we started here, we got fewer Ds and Fs than we expected for having more, um, more than 12 hours of extracurricular activities. I can't explain that, but I know that's where the issue is. Um, then we come over here to the next highest. We also had fewer Ds or Fs than we expected down here for less than two hours. And we got more high grades up here than we expected. So it's not that you're looking at, I'm sorry, we got fewer high grades than we expected. <clears throat> so looking at the components of chi-square, we would say that more than 12 hours of um, extracurricular activities, that's where the issue is. Because <clears throat> we got fewer um, A's, B's, and C's than we expected, and more D's and F's than we expected. And here we got more D's and F's for less than two hours as well. So if we were to do a follow-up analysis, I'd certainly look up these two and maybe this one and try to find who are these students? What can we learn from, from this analysis? So that's how a computer is going to make it um, do the printout for the chi-square analysis. Notice that it just puts the expected value right underneath the observed value, so you don't need to create a second table. Um, but they did down here kind of sort of do a second table for the chi-square components. All righty. So now we're going to look at our next problem. <coughs> If I can figure out where the thing is to share my screen, I get lost so much in this. There it is. So our next problem, oh, looks like the picture's covering something there, is <clears throat> where you want to um, try to treat cocaine addiction. And we have three treatments. We have a drug called disipramine. We have a drug called lithium. And then we have a placebo. Remember that when we do um, experiments, we always like to have that control group so that we can see if um, it's um, the placebo effect that might cause a change or if it's actually our treatment. So our hypothesis is, our hypotheses are going to be, the null will be that there is no relationship between the drug used and relapse. In other words, um, they're independent of each other. And if a patient doesn't relapse, um, that means that they don't go back to using the drug, and that means that uh, they don't go back to using cocaine, and hence our medicine, our medical drug, is effective. <clears throat> what we hope to find, though, is that there's a, a good drug out there that'll work, and there is a relationship between the drug used and the relapse rate. That's what we hope to find. So let's take a look at some printouts. <clears throat> so we have 24 subjects on disipramine. 14 of them didn't relapse. Woohoo, 58% didn't relapse. That sounds good. 
We have 24 patients on lithium, six didn't relapse. Mm. And it's only 25%. And then the placebo, only four. The problem, we, you might just look at this and go, man, almost 60% of them didn't relapse. Dicipramine must be great. The problem is we don't know that yet without a statistical analysis, because what if we compared just um, proportions? We could compare this proportion to this one, this proportion to this one, this proportion to this one. That'd be two, I'm sorry, three, two sample Z tests for proportions. And what we don't really know is maybe the, you know, since this is um, sample data, maybe the population data, all three proportions for the population are the same. And it just so happens that, you know, through random variation, this number was higher than average. This number was lower than average. Um, but they're within the bounds that you would expect from random variation. So we can't just look at the three and do um, a Z test. We need to do a chi-squared test for independence to see if there's a relationship between the drug used and the relapse rate. <clears throat> now notice that we only have no relapse here. In order to create our two-way table, we need to create a relapse column. So here's the no relapses. We also need the yes relapses to add up to our 24 total people in each column. So on Dicipramine, 14 of them stayed clean, 10 of them reused. In Lithium, six of them stayed clean, 18 reused. And on the Placebo, four of them stayed clean, 20 reused. We wanna know as if these differences, we'll go back here, if these differences, these multiple proportions, um, are they different enough to suggest that there's a relationship between the drug and the relapse rate? So if we were to put this data into um, statistical analysis software, I need a, uh, an expected value for each of these six cells. So for this 14, it would be 24 times 24 divided by 72. And let's see, 24 divided by 72 is one third times 24 is eight. So that should be an eight here. And since for both of these, well, we'll just skip and show it to you. So 24 times 24 over 72, since it's 24 in all three rows, it's gonna be the same number in the first column. So we would expect Eight, if um, there was no relationship, we would expect on average eight um, people taking disipramine um, to stay clean and 16 of them to relapse. Now, it's not always going to be the same that this is eight, 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 and 16, 16, 16. That just happens because all three of these numbers are the same. <coughs> anyway. Um, so we have our observed minus expected, so that would be 6. Quantity squared is 36, divided by 8. That's where the 4.5 came from. And um, there's no warning here because all of our expected values are greater than 5. We have 2 degrees of freedom because it's 2 minus 1 times 3 minus 1. 1 times 2 is 2. And our p-value is, well, here's our chi-squared statistic of 10 and a half, and our p-value is a half a percent. We would reject the null, conclude that there is a relationship between the drug used and whether they relapse or not. Where is that relationship? Where are the biggest components of chi-square? Well, we had a lot more successes on um, disipramine than we expected and a lot fewer relapses. That sounds good. And then we can come down here too. The next highest one is um, um, the placebo category. We had a lot fewer successes and a lot more relapses than we expected. 
So this would indicate that disipramine might be a good drug um, for treating cocaine. We would need further testing. But that's how you do a chi-square test for independence. You <clears throat> determine the expected values in your two-way table, come up with your chi-squared components, get your statistic, and from that, a p-value. Or um, if you're doing it by hand, compare it to a critical value off a table. Either way, in this case, we rejected the null hypothesis, concluded that there is a relationship. Or another way of saying that is that the drug and relapse rates are uh, not independent. <coughs> <coughs> so <clears throat> let's review how to do our hypotheses. Our null hypothesis is that the row variable and column variable are independent, that there's no relationship. And of course, when you write your hypotheses, you want to tell me what the row variable and column variables are. In our last problem, the row variable was the drug type and the column variable was the relapse rate. So the, um, um, the type of drug and the relapse rate are independent. That would be our null hypothesis meaning that there's no relationship between them. None, none of those three treatments is any different from the others, statistically speaking. But we rejected that null and concluded that the alternate is true, that the drug and the relapse rates are not independent. There is some relationship. And our initial analysis concluded that disipramine um, worked pretty well and placebo did not. So the um, improved treatment from the disipramine um, was probably caused by the disipramine, not the placebo effect. <clears throat> Shrink down a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> All righty. So when we say that, there, um, that the two variables are independent or that there's no relationship, it means that the related proportion should be equal. Not that everything should be 50%. <clears throat> In our last problem, these were 8, 8, 8, and 16, 16, 16. <clears throat> Well, actually, no, that was our expected values. We had a 58%, a 25%, and a 16%. That doesn't mean that the relapse rate that the, the should be 50-50 or 12 and 12. That's not what it means. That means that these three counts, and if you take their proportion of the total, that was the 58, the 25, and the 16, I think. Are those proportions the same? That's really what we're doing when we um, conduct the chi-square test for independence. We're seeing if those three proportions are the same. And again, as we always do with chi-squared, we're looking at the proportions, but we're doing the actual counts. So what we want to know here is the null hypothesis. If we were to try to write it as a formula, we might write the null hypothesis, proportion one is equal to proportion two is equal to proportion three. But how would we write the alternate hypothesis if we were to do it with these proportions? And you would not write it this way. And that's because what if P1 and P2 are the same, but P3 is different? Then that's not quite right. That's why the alternate, um, if you were to write it this way, is not all of them are equal. Um, if you had 10 proportions you were comparing, nine of them could be the same and one of them's out of whack and you would reject the null. So 
the the alternates um, saying that there is a relationship. Another way of looking at that, and please don't write it this way. I'm just showing you what it means is that not all of those proportions are equal. So again, to calculate your chi-square statistic, <coughs> um, organize your data into a contingency table with uh, rows and columns. Find the row and column totals, and from those and your total total, you can calculate your expected values. Now you wanna create a second um, contingency table, and that's rows by columns. And you want to put the chi-square component for each um, corresponding cell on that new table. Just to show you what I mean by that, let's go back. Um, oh, I shut it off. So we'll have to, um, uh, man. Cannot minimize zoom while doing this. All right, how about if I do this? All right, now we're getting closer. So if I want to, um, heck, after all this time, I don't even remember what I'm doing. Sorry about that, I totally brain cramped there. Anyway, what I mean by create that second row by column table, that second contingency table, is let's go back to the um, data printout for our drug problem. And you can see here's our contingency table up here with three rows and two columns. Then we have this second table down here that also has three rows and two columns. And the reason we do this is so it's easy to conduct our follow-up analysis. I look right here, that four and a half is in the first row, first column. All right, that's where that four and a half is coming from. Um, the next highest one is 2.25. So that's coming from up here. So clearly this row, decipramine, requires some analysis. And also maybe these two numbers down here, they're pretty high, and that's the placebo. Um, row. So you have one contingency table up here, then you have a second one down here that contains your components. Um, if you watch Khan Academy, he puts all these six numbers just in a long row like this, but then how do you know which one of those numbers corresponds to which cell on your contingency table up here? That's why I say do just like Minitab does, put your chi-squared components in the same format as you did up here. That way you can tell this one relates to this. This component relates to this. All right, that was kind of a rough video for me. Hope you um, got a lot out of it. Have a great day.